we're, ta we're talking about um, this 5-4 saddle point approximation. And I've used, I've used some terminology interchangeably. 5-4 saddle point with maybe fluctuations set to zero, which is what you're doing on your assignment. I've also introduced the concept of uh, a phenomenological theory called Landau theory, where somehow you know, the field represents an average magnetization. That's magnetization. And I've also said the words mean field theory several times. Um, I just want to clear up some of this terminology today and also discuss how these theories are, are related to each other. Um, the first thing I want to do is uh, <clears throat> clear up this issue with the mass in the 5-4 saddle point approximation. And to do this, I went back and looked at the last thing I was writing um, in the last class. And I just want to be clear about the signs on, on, these, on these path integrals. So let's just go back and review the signs of everything in the Lagrangian. So let's start with a single particle case. When you, um, when you derive the single particle path integral, the first thing, the thing that you should be most comfortable with, I guess, is the, the thing I call the propagator. It's the matrix element or whatever of, you know, a particle that's evolved from a position x to x prime, time to time prime, t to t prime. So that's the functional integral, okay, of e to the, let's call it i s, or i over h bar. I set h bar and Boltzmann constant to 1 here. And this is just e to the i. So it's the integral over time, 1 half mv squared minus a potential. OK, it should be something that you did on assignment 2, I think, right? But when you wick rotate into imaginary time, So, for example, to write the partition function, which means you have, every time you have t, you replace by i minus i tau, and then you're your path integral, which is your partition function, remember there's periodic boundary conditions in time you have to worry about and so on, but we'll just imagine this in the infinite continuum. So what I, what I have is, let me do every step here, so I have a time derivative, or sorry, a time integral, so I have minus i that comes in front of my, so I have an i in front, and I'm just substituting in a minus i d tau, 1 half m. Remember, there's a time derivative here. Squared minus v of x. All right, all right, like that. <clears throat> okay, so I have a minus sign, but I have... I'm just keeping track of minus signs here, All right? So I've uh, i times i minus cancels, right? This thing is a an i squared, which gives an overall minus sign in front of the kinetic energy term, right? So I know this is simple, but <clears throat> I just want to keep track of all the signs, basically in the Landau theory. So I have a plus there, but I have a minus out front here. Right, and so you can basically write that like
e to the minus in action, which is d tau, and then everything's plus, right? One half m x squared plus v of x. <clears throat> okay, simple enough. So when you do the phi four theory, it's the same thing. Okay, you can either write the, the path integral in terms of t, the time, the time evolution, or you could wick rotate for imaginary time, depending on, you know, what you want, right? So, one expression in terms of the fields, let's say e to the i, now I have a d-dimensional integral, and the Lagrangian. So we write it like that, then the, the Lagrangian, which depends on phi. Is just something like this. <clears throat> so there's a one half, I'll keep it out in front. And what was I calling this thing? Am I gonna use M? Why not? So forget the, the potentials. I'll talk about this in a minute, so. The way to think about this is it's just like you have a, a the analogy of the potential, which is maybe the phi squared term or the phi four term or however high you go in that expansion, right? <clears throat> so, The, the thing to keep in mind is this notation here has signs associated with it, right? So I know I keep writing this thing, but okay, so you have a, a plus sign for time and you have a minus sign for however high, you know, if it's d equals one, two, three, however high uh, dimension you go. So there's a sign structure. Right, and in this case it's plus, minus, minus, minus. It's like the Minkowski metric. Of special relativity. <clears throat> and after you wick rotate, that sign structure changes. Again, and, and the reason it changes is because only one of these is a time derivative, right? So when you start putting in minus i tau, you define that derivative with respect to tau, but you have to keep track of all the minus signs. And so the analogous thing happens to the sign, the, the way that we write the action in the 5-4 theory, right? So. Minus i tau. So the Lagrangian, which is this thing here, has a term that's like um, minus i tau squared, right? So the same thing happens, you have to pull, you know, i squared out in front of this thing and you pick up a minus sign, right? So, so that implies the partition function written in terms of the fields. We'll pick up that overall minus sign in front if we write our Lagrangian with a Euclidean metric, if you will. which means I pulled out that minus sign <clears throat> in the same way. And my integral, which has one time component, has the same, uh, you know, 
i times i out front, which gives a minus sign. And so my Lagrangian is just plus then all the potential terms, right? And so it looks very similar to something I would write, you know, here, except, well, except this thing's now containing this, this sign structure where everything's positive here. So this is Euclidean, which means plus, 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 however many dimensions are in your d plus one, right? <clears throat> so when I write a Lagrangian, okay, if, if I'm working in Minkowski or Euclidean space, if you will, basically the only thing that looks different when I write that Lagrangian is this, this sign. So it means that we have to determine sign conventions for all the parameters in our Landau theory. And that's what I wasn't careful with last time, so. So they're arbitrary, but let's say decide. Because in the Landau theory, all we've done is written a free energy or a potential, right? Which uh, you could call it V. I think what I defined last time was something like this for the 5 4 theory. Okay, so let me get back to this. So that's what we want to determine. When I, dero when I derived, derove, <laughs> the, uh, the Klein-Gordon equation, remember I did it with, with the Minkowski sign structure, right? So <clears throat> I should have written the, the, the Lagrangian as the kinetic piece, say, minus the potential. I compared to I so I think I set the you have to set the phi four term equal to zero to get the Klein Gordon equation. <clears throat> But I'll write both terms out so you see that it has the structure basically like, like up here, right? <clears throat> and so from that we determined, okay, so if u is equal to zero, then I should get from the equations of motion, so what I wrote last time was plus signs here, but then I compared it to Right, a Minkowski type <clears throat> sign structure. So if I if I define it with minus signs, then the equation I would have got was this, which you're comparing to uh, d squared plus m squared phi equals zero, and that gives our is related to the mass. <clears throat> Okay, so it's in direct comparison to these two equations. But when I write the Landau theory, I'm writing a free energy, which means I'm motivated by Euclidean, the Euclidean path integral because it's like a partition function, right? So. Somehow, somehow we want a free energy or free energy density. 
And because I'm thinking of a partition function, maybe finite temperature stat mac. My path integral should have completely isotropic space time, right, from the wick rotation. <laughs> so, so that means up there, my free energy density should have this sign. Which is basically associating, you know, that free energy with the Lagrangian density in a higher dimensional integral there. So, and this is how your assignment for question two Lagrangian should be written. So, e to the minus s of phi or s of phi. Right, so all d is d plus one dimensions, but all dimensions are equivalent. Something like this plus u over four, five, four. <clears throat> okay, so actually when you write the action, there's this ambiguity in the sign of the potential. Unless you specify whether or not you're in Euclidean space, or if you write out, you know, the the uh, functional integral part, so that you see whether or not it's like a minus here, or whether or not it's imaginary, right? So okay, so that's that. So so if we take this sign convention, then the only thing that changes from what I said last time was basically the sign here, because I was just sloppy and I wrote plus signs on my Lagrangian like I'm used to. Okay, so if you look back at your notes, we're talking about spontaneous symmetry breaking. We need R to change sign through the phase transition. That defines the phase transition. And so R is just some function, I don't know what I called it, maybe R1, whatever, T minus TC. <clears throat> and when R is less than zero in the Landau theory, that corresponds to the uh, symmetry broken case. You know, that's the perfect. But therein lies the problem because if you want to compare this to the mass term, then your interpretation of the mass looks screwed up. <clears throat> so let's say for the uh, For the real-time propagator, the Lagrangian would look something like so it would be something like minus R here, right? <clears throat> I had this all figured out until the last step. So if R is negative, it's always R here, sorry. So if R is negative, then it's something like, uh, it's minus the absolute value of R, right? That's one half, see, plus higher over terms. <clears throat> yeah, okay, right. So that means that the mass would be imaginary. Mass squares, or mass would be square root of minus r, right? <clears throat> so that should occur for the case. 
Okay, so there's no problem with interpretation basically before you have the symmetry breaking. So an R is greater than zero. So it's only in this case where you have this spontaneous symmetry breaking. So what does that imaginary mass mean? Well, basically it means that it's not a mass. I mean, what else could it mean, right? So. Uh, yep. What happens with the correlation function? Because the correlation length is related to, to the mass. So you have right. in the symmetry, in the symmetric space, you have this exponentially decaying uh, correlation function. Uh, but if you go to the broken symmetry space, yeah. it seems that you have like a cosine or sine kind of correlation function. Right? So the correlation function diverges at the transition, basically. Right. And then on the other side of the transition, it depends how you define the correlation function. If it's from the connected two-point correlation function, if you're subtracting off, the yeah, then it basically goes back to zero as you go to zero. Um, but it's still exponentially decaying. It's yeah, yeah. Right. On either side of the transition, it's exponentially decaying by that definition. Yeah. So I won't derive that. We'll do, we do that in 705. So the correlation, yeah, just, just to answer that, yeah, the correlation function diverges somehow at TC with an exponent, which is well, nu, is it, or minus nu, right? So it, it diverges on each side, and then, you know, it's exponential decay. <clears throat> is a fun, you know, the two-point correlation function is exponential on each side. That's the, that defines the correlation length. Psi is defined as, like, it's how you envelope the exponential. So the two-point correlation function has, a, has an exponential envelope, and it's kind of the width of that envelope is, is I should learn the name of that symbol, but that's right, 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 correlation. For, for t is smaller than tc, it looks like that width is complete. Right, right. but you, yeah, so but what, if you derive, yeah, you have to look at the correlation function derived in the case when the magnetization is non-zero for the connected two-point correlation function. Yeah, so we do all that in 705. Boop. I teach it. It's like this. <laughs> it's like, yeah, how do I know everything? Actually, Anton teaches it sometime, which is better. But when I, but, but we alternate these two classes, one 705, which is all renormalization group, basically, and then one's this class, so we alternate back and forth. So the moral of this class is you should take 705. And I, when I take 705, <laughs> when I teach 705, it's like, you should take the other class. <laughs> So, I mean, yeah, they're like the same class, but like different somehow. Wait, is that Statmec? Or That's event Statmec, yeah. Or Statmec 2 or whatever it's called, yeah. But in that case, there's no quantum mechanics at all in, in that case. So we derive the same sort of field theory, but it's all from classical Statmec, which, which is, that's because, you know, quantum and classical is the same thing, right? So, <clears throat> and that's why. <laughs> right, so this imaginary mass just means it's, it's not a mass. So in this specific case, it's not the right interpretation. So this is the case where we have a free energy density that has those two, I'll, re, I'll redraw it. Like I said last time, potential or free energy is a function of, I forget if I call this phi or m. <clears throat> Basically have these two values of, you know, let's say call them phi bar minus phi bar. <clears throat> and you have a tunneling barrier, which I think you're calculating in your in your assignment. Which has to do with the free energy density difference, but also you have to integrate over that free energy density difference. So what you should find is that it's extensive. And what it means is, um, what it means is that spontaneous symmetry breaking applies, where you have to choose one or the other. So there's no fluctuations you know, in the same sense that there's a phi squared fluctuation in, in the original field variables. And that's why in the last part of assignment four, question two, or whatever, you, you look at fluctuations around around, say, phi bar. Uh, maybe I call it V. 
the vacuum expectation value. So when you look at fluctuations around the vacuum expectation value and you plug, you know, the, you know, the, the phi back into that full Lagrangian, which, which has the space-time variations associated with it, then you should get the same form uh, of Lagrangian that you can compare, you know, basically to this, uh, this Klein-Gordon equation. And so then you should have, so I think if you do phi equals V plus phi prime, then the Lagrangian... Or phi prime will have a mass term of the proper sign, which and, and the mass term is a coefficient of phi prime squared. So it's like you've chosen you've chosen one of these two spontaneous symmetry broken um, values, and you're looking at small fluctuations around that minimum, and the equations of motion for those fluctuations around that minimum are what you can interpret as a particle that has a mass. <clears throat> okay, so that's that's where the mass comes out in the case when you have symmetry breaking. Well, it's like the free energy at you know phi equals zero and minus the free energy at at whatever the symmetry broken value of v is, right? But then you know, the, the full, this is like the free energy density. So if you integrate over space time, I just gave you the answer that that should be extensive just because of that integral, right? So, so it means that in the field theory, in the continuum, that there's, there's a one over infinity probability of tunneling, which is zero, right? <clears throat> so if you have an infinitely large, you know, ferromagnetic uh, Ising model, or something like that. The chance of tunneling between all up to all down is zero. <clears throat> so only quadratic terms with the correct sign describe particles with a mass. <clears throat> if they have the wrong sign, at least at this level in the theory, you're in a symmetry broken state and you have to look at fluctuations about that state. Um, oh, so and the other point is, Okay, so only and they are particles in every sense of the word. I mean, they're quasi-particles, but, you know, at this level of theory, when you're looking at fluctuations out of the vacuum, the theory of these particles is as real as the theory of any elementary particle in high energy. <clears throat> so it's, the, it, yeah, it's only when that phi squared term has the correct sign. And also that phi squared term can be hidden in the Lagrangian. Um, Just do a series expansion to see, to see it, uh, to look for quadratic terms. So exa for example, you can have a Lagrangian that's just, okay, so minus some potential, like an exponential or something. I don't know what they call it. Okay, whatever. So if you see that Lagrangian, it's like, well, there's no mass. There's no massive particle or massive quasi-particle excitation. Of course, all you do is expand the exponential out, and the, if you have the right sign in front of the, the phi squared term, then that's, where you, that's how your mass appears. <clears throat> Questions? Mm -hmm. It's because the equations are the same, right? It's not even an, an analogy, really. It's like, do you have a theory of space-time and whatever d plus one dimensions, the equations of motion that come from minimizing the action, if you will, in the saddle point approximation, right? So, so in that case, you, they are the Klein-Gorin equations. 
So just in the same way that the Klein-Gordon equation comes from interpreting you know, <clears throat> the equations of motions for a free particle in, in relativity, you know, so does the so does the five four theory just give you the same interpretation? So, <clears throat> I mean that's a little philosophical, but I think it's you know I think it's in the structure of quantum theory, if it's the same equations, then basically you can you can completely interpret everything as, as particles with that mass. So what, what's interesting is basically when you go through phase transitions, that that interpretation breaks down because that mass term goes to zero. Then you don't have any quasi-particle excitations of any mass, the theory becomes massless. And you can't sort of use any of these analogies to figure out what's going on. That, and that's why the study of phase transitions and quantum phase transi transitions is so interesting, I think. So I just want to say a few more things about phase transitions before we move on. Um, so a bit more about Landau theory. So again, it's like the phenomenological construction of this free energy density. And you're just interpreting, interpreting the state as the like ball rolling around the potential minimum. <clears throat> and so last time we looked at how the 5-4 theory you know, gives a continuous transition. So some in some action that look or some uh, Lagrangian density or free energy that looks like this up to phi four. You can have phi six if you want, but as long as u is positive, then you have something that's above criticality. So that's r greater than zero. The critical point. And then below criticality, you get something like that. So this value of the average magnetization it continuously evolves from zero, so the minimum of the R greater than zero solution, to these spontaneously broken states. And you pick one of them. Such that you get a magnetization that is continuously evolving as a function of temperature. <clears throat> the free energy, by the way, let's see, the, the derivative is zero, but also as you go through this solution, the, you know, the minimum, uh, or so, so, you know, the minimum evolves such that the free energy changes concavity from concave up to concave down. So it means not only is your, your derivative of your free energy equal to zero, but the second derivative is also. So the second derivative. Okay, so that's one hallmark of a continuous transition, sometimes called second order transitions. <clears throat> um, okay, I'll talk a bit more about this in a minute, but as I mentioned last time, there's, there's a, basically another class of, of phase transitions called a first order phase transition. And a first order phase transition is also contained within Landau theory. I guess arguably it's first order transitions that you see most often in nature. <clears throat> so in a first order transition, 
the free energy just evolves in a different, you know, in a in a qualitatively different way through the transition temperature. So I can construct a Landau theory that has a first order transition. Actually, I can construct it from here. So just let me look at the same free energy density. Um, so remember I told you the, the phi six term is basically irrelevant. All it does is, is at, you know, tighten up the, uh, the sort of shape of the non-parabola because this thing's already positive. But if this thing ever changed sign, and remember you just have a phenomenological parameter out front, it's just, it's just you. But if, if for some reason that, that, that you change sign, then number one, the behavior might be different. Number two, you need to have a, a finite positive V in order to keep the free energy bounded. <clears throat> so let's look at that case. So um, let's... Okay, so I'm, I've, I've written the same, I've written the 5-4 theory, but one order higher. Um, what did I say? For u greater than zero, so v is so the qualitative, I guess, structure of the theory doesn't change. But if you goes negative, <clears throat> for whatever reason, in the microscopics, <clears throat> then, or, so we need uh, V to be positive. That's why, that's like the justification of going to one higher order in Landau theory. So if our U is positive, we don't need this. But if, if the U goes negative, we need that term to keep the free energy bound. It has to be going you know, up positive, up to positive infinity. So why does the free energy have the same basic form as the new Lagrangian? Um, so, so like I said last time, so the, it's basically because the free energy is minus log of the partition function. Okay, and you and you approximated the partition function with just the maximum value of the full functional integral, which is just e to the minus, you know, uh, action, and the action is the integrated Lagrangian, right? And so you're taking ln of that exponential, so you're basically looking at the action and you're minimizing the action, which means minimizing the Lagrangian. Yeah. So that's why I that's why I was insistent on all this sign convention at the start, because if you're going to interpret, if you're going to interpret this as the Lagrangian, you want to make sure you're looking at um, the path integral that's in Euclidean space, because that's how the partition function is. You know, Z comes from Euclidean, from the Wick rotation, and then this gives you the Lagrangian with all the plus signs here. <laughs> that's, that's a basic idea. Like I said, there's three different theories I'm actually talking about. I'm using them interchangeably. So Landau theory, I mean, Landau didn't derive this from field theory. He just wrote, he just wrote down a free energy density. And by symmetry, he said, okay, the free energy density, density is analytic, except that the transitions, and it's got the symmetry of the Hamiltonian. So often you'll see Landau theory. By the way, who saw Landau theory before this class? Right, so you'll see Landau theory without reference to the action or to the field theory, right? So what I'm hopefully trying to do here is take Landau theory and relate it to, to the thing that we've derived, right? <clears throat> right, so you probably know all this, what I'm gonna say then, but Landau theory contains um, the first order transition when the sign of U is negative. So how do we find out what's going on? You basically d d differentiate. Uh, 
Uh, okay, so I'll just leave it as R. Okay, and there's, there's, oh, that's one. There's two solutions, or there's maybe three solutions or something. But you have to be a little bit more careful. So if you just factor out a, a phi term and use a quadratic formula, you'll get, you'll get the solutions to this thing. Okay, so, but it's actually a solution of phi squared, right? What do I call this thing, uh, V? Yeah, that's probably right. Um, so I'm gonna say it's minus U. That's the same as plus the magnitude of U, because U is minus, but you see, you gotta be careful of this term here, because you don't wanna have imaginary solutions. So you cannot, you know, you don't ignore it. There's physics contained in this. So what's actually happening is happening is remember your R is somehow proportional to, to T minus some constant, which we've been calling TC. <clears throat> but now it's not TC, you should call it T naught. There's no critical point anymore in this case. So it's just T minus some constant, T naught. And the sign of the argument of that thing will change, right? So if, if you're at high temperature, uh, then you'll get, imaginary, uh, you'll get an imaginary number from that square root. And that's, that's the case that the minima don't exist. And so then you should basically just use the solution phi equals zero. In the magnetic language, that's the same paramagnetic state as, you know, so the free energy has the same shape as this thing here. There's one minimum at phi bar equals zero. So that's a high temperature paramagnetic state. There's no magnetization. <clears throat> um, right, and so then there's this critical, or this, um, I forget the technical word for it, value when u squared is equal to four RV. Okay, where, so this thing goes through zero and starts becoming uh, positive, where you're gonna get, you're gonna get real roots to this. Okay, so. So there's some temperature, which you can just solve this equation for in terms of R equal to T minus T naught. And what happens is you'll get, it's, a, it's basically the point where, where you start to get real minima in the free energy functional here. Okay, so right here and here. So those, those real solutions, or those real, real roots to the equation start to, they start to appear, but they're not necessarily minimum of the free energy density. So that's why they're called metastable. So what happens is you continue to lower R. I'll just draw this here. So as you continue to lower R, from high to low temperature, you get something like this. So R large. <clears throat> At 
the at the moment, uh, the argument of that square root becomes zero. You get this. I don't know how you draw it. You get the appearance of these metastable states. <clears throat> then eventually, these things move down. And you get the transition point. So you can imagine the minima that, that occur here just moving down. So this is the actual first order transition. And then as you continue to lower the temperature, uh, you get something that looks like this. <clears throat> Okay, so you get there's actually two more regimes. One where you still have a concave up region around the origin, and then at some point that thing no longer becomes metastable and flips like that, flips concavity. So, so this is very very low temperature, very low T. So, so if you're using here the the energy density, it seems that that tunneling where you're between the same minima, mm -hmm. the thermodynamic limit is also infinite. Yep. So then how, how come you can see first order transitions in, in nature? Well, there's a lot of complication with first order transitions because of this. So what you actually get here is phase coexistence because of that. So right at the transition or near the transition, um, near T, I don't know what I'm going to call it, T1. That's why your ice cubes float and live in your water and all this stuff, right? That's why you get super cooling and super heating. It's because you because first order transitions are are phase coexistence transitions. It means that both of these phases exist right at the critical point. And they exist in a thermodynamic limit right at the critical point. And so what happens is you get so you know if you trace the magnetization, just like I did here at that first order transition. So what am I doing? So this is the minimum versus T. You go up to T1, and then you have a jump here. You have, so you have a, a strict discontinuity in that, in that magnetization. So what this, what this translates into is discontinuities. You know, so if you looked at the energy, or the, well, the energy would have a discontinuity of any of these first order systems. It might look like this. I don't know. The free energy. OK, so well, you, you know what the free energy looks like. It also has a discontinuity. <clears throat> but these two branches of, say, the energy would correspond to, say, the paramagnetic and ferromagnetic state, or, you know, liquid water and solid water. And as you know, you get, if you start out in one of the phases and you continuously lower the temperature, you can get a hysteresis here. So at some point, you know, you can super cool a liquid or you could superheat, you know, a solid and you get this so-called hysteresis region. Which basically comes from the fact that these, these free energy barriers are hard, hard to surmount. You, know? you have to really push yourself deep sometimes into the wrong phase in order to get enough um, sort of free energy gain in order to, to snap yourself into that phase. So I mean, if you did this strictly in a thermodynamic limit, uh, you, could, you could drag this hysteretic region all the way down to zero temperature. But in, in practice, what happens is some fluctuations that exist in the system, you know, thermal fluctuations or fluctuations around these minima, right, actually eventually push you over because of energetic reasons. Question. Do you think the uh, same thing could be happening in the uh, uh, super gap region now, like the price of products? <laughs> like, uh, like, even well, there's some new papers out now that say the pseudogap regime is influenced by a, a quantum critical point which would 
which would be a, a critical fan associated with a continuous phase transition. But yeah, you better off asking someone like Sabir about that. <clears throat> so which region are you talking about, by the way? If, are you talking uh, about hysteresis? Like, yeah, and the fluctuations of like Well, so there's some, you know, if you have, if you construct a Landau theory for the pseudo gap, you have terms that are, uh, you have like higher order terms that connect not just a scalar field, let's say O2 cross O2 cross O2, but in all these things. And so you can get first order transitions yeah, between um, the order parameters associated with those fields, I think in that Landau theory. Yeah, so you can definitely have something like that. Um, the, the quantum critical point I'm talking about is, is the origin of the approximate symmetry. But then if you have symmetry breaking terms, which just mean phenomenology, it just means either you have terms that look like this negative, or you can have some odd order terms. Then you can definitely get like, say if you have a CDW phase to a, to a disordered region in the pseudo gap, you can definitely get hysteresis. Actually, I'll, I'll just mention something about that. Uh, so anyway, yeah, so you get discontinuities, you get free energy, you know, discontinuities, and then associated with first order transitions is a latent heat, right? So, so your latent heat basically just comes from the fact that the entropy has a discontinuity. And your heat's like T times delta S for this discontinuity. I don't know. I don't really think in terms of latent heat that much. <clears throat> Maybe you chemists do. So if you have a latent heat release of the transition, it's just because of this discontinuity. <clears throat> so yeah, just to, just to say something further, this isn't the only Landau theory that contains um, a first order transition. And I can write one. Did I write one here? That's just odd in the field. All right, so if you're, yes. So another example, if U was uh, not negative, if for some reason in the symmetry of the Hamiltonian, you lost this reflection symmetry, say phi equals minus. You could have a phi cube term, say. And by the philosophy of Landau theory, <clears throat> where you only include lowest order terms, I mean, that's lower than phi four. So you should include it in your Lagrangian. In your free energy density. Call it small s, I guess. I don't know. And then you would have uh, u over 4, 5, 4. So if for some reason you wrote a Lando theory like that based on whatever symmetries we're talking about and you, you still kept u greater than 0 in order to bound the free energy. So then again, a second minimum like that picture is essentially possible because you have a solution after you differentiate so phi. This one's phi. Uh, if you throw out that term, so you get a phi equals zero solution. And you'll get something like this. So it's the same idea. You have a temperature dependence in that R term. You have a regime with, with uh, an imaginary solution that you throw away. That's the paramagnetic phase. Then you start to develop this metastable minima when this thing equals zero and so on. So it's basically a very similar theory of first order transitions. Phi term is a little different. 
it, um, you know, it skews the minimum. So the phi term gives you a minimum that looks like that, and then it gives you uh, a symmetric minimum that's skewed. No, that's not right. Through the transition, it's it's just flat like that. So it's just a, it's just a, it just biases you towards one of the potential minima. So it's a little bit different, yeah. I talked about it a bit last time. Okay, first order transitions, even though they're ubiquitous in nature, are boring, so we're done with them, right? Just be aware that they exist. So the is there like a physical system that has this like space? Yeah, so if uh, if you have a, a ferromagnet and you apply a small field, field that's couples directly to that phi term. Yeah. So that's the kind of like typical Lando theory you would see. <laughs> um, so we have Lando theories, basically phenomenological. We have five four theories, like the one you're deriving on your assignment. And these are equivalent, right? In the case where you use a saddle point approximation in the phi four theory, you set all the fluctuations to zero. There's no derivative of the fields occurring in this minimiza minimiz minimization process. And I've also called this thing a mean field theory. So why, why did I call it a mean field theory? So let's, let's just use this um, terminology in an example. Which is just the classical Ising model. Okay, so I can, so what you're doing on your assignment is concretely relating this classical Ising model to the phi four theory, right? And if you wonder why it's quantum, remember the first thing we did in this class was relate the D dimensional transit field Ising model to a d plus one dimensional uh, classicalizing model, right? So in this case, essentially the quantum and, uh, and classical stat mech problems are equivalent except for this extra dimension. <clears throat> so mean field theory is another sort of derivation of, of Landau uh, or, or phi four theory. And uh, let me just sketch that out quick because it comes from slightly different physical motivations, but I think it's it's good to know. So let let me let me work in terms of to make things concrete uh, magnetizations, which are just like expectation values of the operators which are occurring directly in the Hamiltonian. Okay, so let me just start from this. Forget about all the uh, Forget about all the functional integrals and everything for a minute. <clears throat> so I want to solve, somehow solve for the behavior of this model. And I want to do so essentially by assuming that fluctuations are small, which is the, kind of the same assumption that was made uh, in the saddle point approximation. So what that means is if I divide this magnetization term, Or more accurately, if I divide the spin state on site I into an average or a mean magnetization, which is that M there, plus fluctuations, or say plus deviations from that mean value. So I may, I'm making an assumption that my field is almost always in the same direction, say, or my magnetization is basically always pointing in one direction, and I have some small deviations from that. Okay. That's the essence of mean field theory. So then um, I'll say these deviations 
I'll call them delta S Z I. They depend on the site. So they're the value of that magnetization minus this mean value. <clears throat> so no approximation yet. But you can see how you can make a nice sort of pertur perturbation theory with this by substituting in for SZ, you know, mean plus fluctuations into this interacting term. This is the term you can't solve. So you substitute that into the interacting term. And then you can expand that, or you could, you know, you can expand it out to all orders in fluctuations. Or if you're in some regime of small fluctuations or small deviations, you can just cut that perturbation theory off. <clears throat> and so that's kind of the philosophy we'll take with the mean field theory. So let me write the Hamiltonian in terms of this. So for every SIZ, I want M plus delta SIZ. And ignore terms second order and higher. <clears throat> okay, so you're assuming fluctuations or deviations aren't significant when you do this. In your Hamiltonian. I'm doing it to the interacting term. I'm not going to do it to the field term. <clears throat> because I'm only neglecting second order terms anyway. Um, so I have i and uh, j here. I have two different indices on these things. <clears throat> okay, so that term. What delta s i z squared say? Right, so I only want to keep the magnetization squared and m times the deviations. Okay, so then I have minus j sum over all i j m squared is my first term. <coughs> That m, m squared is just a scalar. I pull it out of that sum. So you have to remember what this thing means. It's the number of bonds. That's what defines a bond. So. Let me just write that for now. Okay, so there's some extensive number of bonds that comes out of that first term. <clears throat> and then I have Jm. What? So I have sum over all of these bonds. S, J, Z. <clears throat> okay, now I have to think a little bit about how all these bonds look. If we have a hypercube, In d dimensions, <clears throat> so in two dimensions, you have, say you have four sites, right? You have two bonds per site. If that's a torus, if that's a four-site torus, if that's a thing, I don't even know. So in higher dimensions, you basically just have uh, <clears throat> two to the two d, right? Number of bonds. So, <clears throat> you, know, you, you always have two, you always have D times the number of site bonds. So when you have a sum like that, right, so if you look at this thing here, this is site index I, maybe this is J, right? So you'll have four bonds touching that I. So in general, that's two D 
times that that I index occurs in that sum. And that's like the delta SI term. So each delta S appears two D times. So if it's not a hypercube, I mean, it could be a triangular lattice. It could be a, a honeycomb, kagami, hyperkagami, pyrochlor, whatever lattice you want, then that will actually change. That can just be called the coordination number, Z. Okay, but we'll just deal with hypercubes. <clears throat> it doesn't make any difference, actually, for this. So I have to have that 2D out front, M. Now I just have a single sum over S, Z, I. Uh, what else? Minus the field. Okay. <clears throat> so I have this fluctuation term, but I can replace it with this. S, Z, I minus M. Signs look okay, I think. <clears throat> so you see, you'll get a piece that just has a magnetization squared and a sum overall, you know, call it N, the complete number of sites, total number of sites. Then you have a term that just looks like a, a field term, right? So you've modified the field term. And that one's minus, that one's minus, S, I, Z. These sums go from 1 to N. <clears throat> the first two terms don't cancel because this is 2 times the number of bonds. That was lucky. This is actually 2 N, B, right? Bah, it's like the hardest thing of this problem is Counting the number of bonds. <clears throat> but I'm 99% sure that's right. Uh, okay, so I just have a 2D out front there. Mm -hmm, plus H, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's handle that. Actually, we can handle that uh, term easier in a free energy term. So what I'm going to do is now I have a Hamiltonian. I want to relate this to, say, the Landau theory. So the Landau theory is a theory of free energy, free energy density. <clears throat> so let's calculate the free energy density from this thing. So my free energy density is my free energy density. And so n is my number. I'm going to calculate it in terms of the number of sites on this, on this lattice. Um, right, so then my free energy is minus uh, T log, T ln Z. Oh yeah, so you, you better know how to calculate a partition function here. <clears throat> So this is the like quintessential problem,ing sort of <laughs> stat mac, many body stat mac or condensed matter. So how do you calculate that partition function? 
You're tracing over all the states of the system, which are all the spin configurations, you know, plus or minus one, whatever you want to call them. Might as well use plus or minus one. Um, and we know what the Hamiltonian is. Okay, so okay, so two D M G sum S. So the only time the variables which occur in the trace. Uh, occurs in the second term. Everything else is just this sort of mean field scaled by a bunch of factors. So I can pull that factor out, out front. <clears throat> um, yeah, let me keep it in the sum for a minute here. So that's all my S at I minus beta. Ah, there's no reason to do that. I'm losing my mind. E to the minus or plus two D M J beta sum I S I Z. Okay. That's the thing you have to calculate the trace over. <clears throat> if we're still summing over spin, but either minus one or one, how does it make sense to ignore these uh, square fluctuations? They're still going to be on the same order, on the same side as the. If these D SIs, uh -huh. let's say M0, and the D SIs are 1 and minus 1. Uh -huh. And they're the same size as the squared one. The, the trace, these aren't the fluctuations. No, I know, but so if mm -hmm. at zero, mm -hmm. which is probably a good average, right. uh, then it would be one minus one minus one. These DSIs. So if you find the M equals zero solution, basically you're saying why, why could you ignore Since fluctuations? Fluctuations are not small. If we're assuming the spin only take values zero and minus one. Um, so you're, I mean, you're assuming somehow that you can have, I, I don't quite see what you're saying. So you can have states that look like this or this or something like that right. or this. And for each one of these, I mean, this would give you a zero total magnetization or something like that. But each one of these spins doesn't deviate on average much from this value. It might spend most of its time in this value and then just once in a while it deviates. That type of fluctuation is the small. Is small. To write mm -hmm. the, uh, the delta SI when m is equal to zero and it spins up, you're going to have e SI be equal to one or minus one. And then the DSI squared is also going to be locked into one. So it's going to have the same size, and you're ignoring the second order one, but not the first order one. When they're the same size. I think this is the assuming the uh, magnetic state. In general, yeah. M should be M I or M J, right? I mean, I think if you're in the high temperature state, the fluctuations are huge, right? So the mean field picture breaks down. Okay. But I think in this interpretation, it's just like, um, like if your, uh, what do they call? It? If your deviations proliferate, then that forces you. Then, then when this assumption breaks down, when those deviations proliferate, and you're in the paramagnetic phase, yeah. it's kind of like the Pyrrhus argument. When you have, look at minority s clusters and they're like a perturbation, they're small, right? And you're doing this free energy expansion around these small clusters. But at some point, those things proliferate. And so the, the basic assumption breaks down. But what it really signals is that phase transition. So M should be probably close to 1 or minus 1 in that phase. So in this, in this type of thing, you're assuming that you have some sort of state, right? Which we know uh, from all this discussion, it has to be one of these ferromagnetic states. And deviations are small around that. So I think if the deviations proliferate, then that breakdown is the phase transition. So obviously, it's really like, <clears throat> I don't know. 
It's like a really cheesy theory. <clears throat> so what you got to do is take this partition, write this trace, take this partition function and write the trace out. This is worth doing like once in your life. This thing just means you have a product, right? It's like a, it's like a functional integral sort of. You just have a product, SI1 equals plus or minus 1, uh, S2 equals plus or minus 1. Whatever. S N. <clears throat> okay, so that part of your okay, so the, the 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 trace you can just write as a whole bunch of separate uh, sums, and you take the product of them all. <clears throat> One e to the see if I forget terms b to the m two d s one z right. So you basically take all the terms in this Hamiltonian, right? And because they're an exponential, you write them as a product, and then each one of the sums from the trace only affects one exponential. S is at two. Right? S is at N. Uh. <clears throat> so each one of those you can evaluate individually. Well, there's just two elements of every sum. Right? There's one where this is positive and one where this is negative. And then there's N you know, these sums, so then the free energy is something like this plus, that's the first term of each sum, and this is the second term, beta j, m2, d, right? There's n of those sums. Okay, so we're almost there. You just have to know what e to the x plus e to the minus x is. Hyperbolic cosine. Mm, let's see, that thing is raised to the n. It looks just like our free energy. No. Well, it obviously doesn't look like our free energy yet. So the next step, stage of the game, of the approximation, is to just expand out your cosine. Your cosh, so cosh of x is 1 plus one half x squared. This term's plus twenty four x to the four, right? <clears throat> okay, so let me let me take my logs now. I've been carrying around this when it's t over n, but I have a log of an exponential. And beta is 1 over t. <clears throat> right, and I have number of bonds, which is 2 times the number of sites or something like that, or d times the number of sites, sorry. So it's d. So the n's cancel and the t's cancel. 
jm squared. I have t over n, but if I take, uh, so I'm taking log of this thing, which is just n log that, so the n's cancel. So my free energy density doesn't have n in it, like it shouldn't, so that's a good sign. I have a 2, though, which sucks. Okay, so x is this whole thing here. To the fourth. <clears throat> and so then the final thing you do is expand the log. So you have a 1 here, so you have a log of 2 plus x, which is just log of 2 plus x over 2. And importantly, you get a minus sign out for the x squared term. And you only keep terms up to m, say, 4. So when you do that, I'm done working it out. Let's write the answer. Every time you see 2D, I think you can replace that with the coordination number for a different lattice. You get that for your free energy density. So it has the same form as the 5-4 theory, which is what you wanted. In particular, it has, this is like your R term, right? So replace M with phi or whatever you want. This is the term that changes sign through the transition. Okay, just solve your 1 over t in this beta for the point when that thing in the square brackets is 0. That will give you a mean field estimate for your phase transition. Okay. And this term here, because of this minus sign here, becomes, is positive. So you get the same structure as the 5-4 theory that we looked at. So that's why I call this 5-4 theory mean field theory. <clears throat> so you derive the structure just completely from the Hamiltonian and assuming that you have, you know, these, you know, every, every SZ variable is its average value with only small fluctuations around that average value, okay? So this is why mean field theory is Equivalent to, say, Landau phenomenological theory. It's equal to the 5-4 theory with the saddle point approximation. So in particular, any of the thermodynamics that you calculate um, in any of these theories is equivalent, essentially. So I want to finish this sort of 5-4 um, scalar uh, saddle point discussion next time. We'll, just, we'll calculate a couple of these thermodynamic properties uh, that are associated with, with, the, with the, cr the critical point in this model. And then we're going to move on to, I guess, maybe O2 or 5-4 or, or theories that have more than one field flavor. And then I guess we're not, having, we're not gonna have too much more time. So I might do some, uh, some gauge theories 
And we'll end off with a little bit of sort of a gauge theories and entanglement and stuff like that.